Okay, so now in our last two sessions, we had the numerical approximation of partial derivatives. And I would like to discuss a nice application of yeah, using partial derivatives, namely that we can extract the density of the underlying of evaluation model by differentiating the European call option prices with respect to the strike twice. And the nice thing of this is that you can apply this to evaluation model, which is a black box to you. So assume you have some software where you can just put in parameters, yeah, market parameters, but also you can value different financial products. So I can value different European options and you just get the values out. Then I can visualize yeah, and infer the probability density that is used from this model. Okay, so here is the little lemma. So this is uh, sometimes also called Breden and Litzenberger yeah, because it's from that paper. So assume that S is some value process, for example, a stock price, but actually the method can also be applied to interest rate derivatives where for example, S is now a forward rate and the option is a caplet, yeah, an option on the forward rate or where um, S is a swap rate and the option is then a swap chain, yeah, an option on swap. So that's uh, not linked here to equity derivatives. Then assume that I have a numeria N that is associated with my um, equivalent martingale measure, QN. So assume the equivalent martingale measures exist and I have a valuation model and I can calculate values by the risk neutral valuation by using the expectation of numeria relative prices with respect to the equivalent Martingale measure. Then I consider as financial product, a European option. So a European option that pays maximum of S of T1 minus K and zero. Maybe it pays this um, thing, which is fixed here in T1. So you see the S is evaluated in T1. Maybe it is paying this at a later time. That 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 is allowed. Yeah. Okay. That's just to make it a little bit more general. Because for a caplet, yeah, in interest rate derivative, these two times would be maybe different. This means that um, if I take the expectation, I divide by the numeraire at payment time. This means it can happen that the numeraire is evaluated here at a different different time. Let us assume that the numeraire has been renormalized such that it is equal to one at the payment time. Okay, that's not an issue, it's just a renormalization. Then I have that the density, the risk neutral probability density of the stock yeah, or of the S, so phi of S, so I assume the density exists. Yeah. So the phi of S is just given by, take the second derivative of the function evaluation with respect to the strike. Yeah. The density at S for the strike being equal to S. And you have to divide by the numeraire. Okay, so divided by to numeria, but that's just a scaling, yeah, so that the integral of the density will be um, again one. So, in other words, if you differentiate the option value with respect to the strike twice, you get numeria in zero times the density. Yeah? So, the probability that the stock will be at the location K. Okay, so this is just my lemma. This is a nice lemma. And I already mentioned this as a small introduction. 
So if a model is given, yeah, for example, like a black box, yeah, then this is uh, very nice because you can use this lemma to just infer the probability density of S of T that is created by uh, the model just by performing repeated valuations, repeated valuations, because if we go back to our session on approximating the partial derivative, I would like to approximate now the partial derivative. I go back to our section on approximation of second order derivatives. I make a functional evaluation at a slightly shifted strike up, a function evaluation at a slightly shifted strike down, minus two times function evaluations at the strike, K, okay. and that should be uh, up to a scaling constant, the density. So this allows for some simple model tests. For, ex for example, if you observe that this quantity is zero in a certain region, it means that the model does not generate any values for the stock in this region. So if that is an important region, yeah, you should be careful in using that model. Or the density, so this expression could be negative. So if the model exhibits regions with negative probability density, Okay, so what does this mean? Okay, it's, it's written here. The model is not um, arbitrage free. Okay, so uh, why, why is that? Okay, so maybe, maybe you know it. Um, if you have a probability density, say for example, it looks like Black-Scholes, yeah, a little bit log normal, but then there's maybe a region where the probability density becomes negative. So we have here this region. Okay, then I just create an option that is always zero, but only pays maybe something here. If you now value this option, the value will be negative, yeah? because it is the value multiplied with the density integrated over all these uh, possible values of the stock. So you have a financial product that has a negative value. So if you buy it, you get something, but it is an option that always pays you something positive. So it is an arbitrage, of course. So you see that negative density is an arbitrage violation. And you can use this to check if your model is creating arbitrage violations. And sometimes numerical implementations create arbitrage valuations. So this is an important test. So this lemma here is a really nice lemma to, to check models and also get intuition how the density looks like. So the proof uh, is easy. Yeah, so I didn't state uh, much of the assumptions. So I assume that... Uh, well, we have a density, everything behaves well. I can interchange uh, differentiation and integration. Yeah, the expectation is the integration. So uh, I didn't state these assumptions, but if you have these uh, assumptions, if everything is sufficiently nice, yeah, which usually for the models which we look at is, then the proof is just um, easy. So um, our risk neutral valuation of the option for a given strike is my payoff function, maximum of S minus K and zero. So the risk neutral valuation is the payoff function divided by the numerator. So I divide here by the numerator at T2. My payoff function, okay. Taking the expectation means since I know the density, I integrate with respect to the density ds over the whole domain from minus infinity to infinity. So now I just apply the differentiation, second derivative. So first derivative with respect to k, I interchange differentiation and integration. I have to differentiate the maximum function. So if you have the maximum function, so there it is your payoff. Then the first step, the d by dk, 
will lead us to the maximum function becomes an indicator function. Yeah. So I have slope zero here and I have slope one here. So it becomes an indicator function actually with a minus in front. Uh, so maybe I do here a minus an indicator function. And then the next step is to differentiate the indicator function that becomes a Dirac delta. Or if you just say that the indicator function is that I have integral from the lower bound K to infinity, differentiating with K is then just the value of the integrand at the lower bound. It's just, and then there's an additional number minus, it's just phi at evaluated at K. So that's all. So the first derivative gives me here this minus indicator function. Okay, so indicator function inside is just the same as integrating from K to infinity. And the second derivative then gives me our result. Second derivative of the value is, and there's still the numeraire in front, the um, numeraire times phi of S um, evaluated at the strike K. Okay, so there's the numeraire in front, but not the numeraire inside. Okay, that was just because I made this assumption that this guy here is equal to equal to one. Yeah. Okay, that's just the renormalization. So I get the numeraire in front of the corresponding numeraire that is one at payment time. You could say that this is the so-called terminal measure. Yeah, it's the probability measure where the numeraire is one at the time when I'm when I'm looking at. An immediately consequence, for example, also a nice consequence in an arbitrage free model. So I have that uh, this density is positive. Yeah? The second derivative has to be positive. So it means that uh, European option prices are convex functions of the strike. So if you spot something that is not convex, in the price function, in the price function, strike maps to option value, then yeah, you should be careful. Your model is not arbitrage free. There's some, some issue. We have 10 minutes left and I would, uh, yeah, maybe test this lemma a little bit. So we can now use our numerical approximation of partial derivatives. I will use the finite difference uh, to, investigate the density of some models. So I have a very nice uh, numerical experiment. So maybe I, can, I do not have time, enough time to do some live coding. Yeah, we could write it down, it's quite short, uh, but maybe, maybe I use the time for a bit more for discussion. So use our finite difference approximation of the second derivative. So this is the V of X plus H minus two times V of X plus V of X minus H divided by H squared. So use that to approximate our density. So to get our risk neutral, implied probability density. So the one created by the model for uh, say um, a stock S at maturity five. So you can you look now at the probability density at different times yeah? um, generated by different models. Uh, we can look at a Black Schultz model. I would expect something log normal, a Bachelier model. I would expect something normal. Uh, we can also look at a Heston stochastic volatility model. So this guy has uh, more parameters. So maybe I could just show you that. So here's the description of all the models we have for single stocks. Here's the Heston model. Okay, so that's from our implementation, the Java doc. And you see the Heston model is DSRSDT plus 
some square root of v as dw. So it is a Black Schultz model in the S component, except that now the sigma here is a stochastic process of its own. Yeah. So it has initial value uh, sigma squared. Yeah. So if these coefficients here, kappa and xi are zero, it will be a Black Schultz model, but uh, kappa is some uh, mean reversion speed. This is some mean reversion level for the um, V, then, um, okay, this is um, the volatility of volatility. It is stochastic volatility. Nice part is you can also have correlation between volatility and the stock value. So maybe we keep that in mind, correlation between volatility. We can let move volatility move up. If the stock moves up, we can also let volatility move down if the stock moves um, up. So let's try this also with a Heston model, maybe then with, for example, two different such uh, correlation uh, parameters. Uh, we can use our Monte Carlo simulation. Yeah? So now we had the session that we can immediately combine different models. Uh, but here you have to be careful. Since we use the Monte Carlo simulation, this comes with a larger numerical error. If you go back to our discussion of approximating partial derivatives, this means that this error alpha Yeah, the error of the V compared to the true value of the V is much, much, much larger if we use a Monte Carlo valuation. So we should maybe use much higher values for the shift. Maybe you could try an 0.2. Yeah? So that's um, a large value given that you have here an initial value of 1.0. You find this experiment if you like to play around in our repository, and I would just uh, discuss with you maybe the code. So here's the guy, underlying density experiment. I just define the parameters which I had on the slide, yeah, an initial value, an R, 5% volatility, 30%, some initial time. We will use an Euler discretization scheme yeah, with uh, different time steps, yeah, 100 time steps up to maturity five. I use 10,000 Monte Carlo simulation path, or maybe you can make it 100,000, yeah? takes a bit longer. The shift size is um, 0.2. Um, yeah, what do we do? So let me comment that out. So the first thing is I define the density and now comes the funny thing. I define the algorithm to calculate the density for any given model. So this model here is now the argument. And what, we, what I will do is I will do the steps that I compose this model to a Monte Carlo simulation. So I need a Brownian motion. So this here is my Brownian motion with the given time discretization. Okay, so initial time, number of time steps. This is the time step size. Um, I use a Brownian motion that has two factors because the Heston model, if you look here, has actually two Brownian drivers, D1 and D2. But I can also use this Brownian motion for the other guys. They just use the D1 and number of paths and seats. So that's just construct the Brownian motion using a mass and twister random number generator. Construct an Euler scheme using the given model. Wrap everything up such that I can value a European option. And then I just define here the function that calculates for a given strike K the value of the European option. So this here is the function that maps K to V of K evaluated in, in T zero, evaluated at initial time. Okay, so I create a European option with the given maturity and the given strike parameter where strike is now a, a function parameter to this function here. And then I return uh, the function. No, I don't return the function. Okay. <laughs> 
And, and then the next step is, if this is the function that maps the value, I calculate the density. So this here is the density, which is the second derivative. So value upshift minus two times value at the strike plus value downshift divided by h squared. Okay, there was the n of t0, the numeraire. Actually, I'm dividing this here, the numeraire, I'm dividing this here. So this is actually divided by n of t0. So that division with the numeraire is already here in this, this function. So you see that this is fairly simple code. And the nice thing is that it now returns a double unary operator. So it returns an operator. If you plug in a strike, you get the finite difference approximation of the density. So this function I can now use to test different models. And as a test, I just want to create a plot. So for a given model, that is also here now my argument, I create the density function, and then I would like to have a plot of this density function, say from minus one to five, minus one to five, the initial value of the stock is at is at one. I have a 5% interest rate. So in five years, maybe the center, the forward is at 1.3, something like that, 1.25, something, 1.3. Okay, so um, uh, ha has a little bit moved, yeah, and then I would like to go from minus one to five, so that I see some range uh, for the density. Okay, so this function will just plot the density. And now I can test this with the Black-Scholz model, the Bachelier model, and I can test it with the Heston model. So let's try that. Okay, so you see, as expected, Black Schultz, the density looks like a log normal distribution. Bachelier looks like normal distribution. Yeah, so it's centered around here. Yeah. Okay, so the 1.3 something. And the Heston looks a little bit like a log normal, but it is different. Yeah. So if you move that here and you jump between the two. So you see it is different. The volatility the density is a little bit higher here. Yeah? So the stock likes to be more often in this region. So what is the Heston model doing? The Heston model has correlation minus eight. So if the stock moves up, volatility moves down. So if volatility moves down, it means that the stock doesn't wiggle so much. So this means when the stock moves up, the wiggling becomes smaller. This also means that it is harder for him to return going down. So he will stay longer in the higher region once he has reached them. If the stock moves down, if the stock moves down, then the wiggling becomes larger. So it means that he will very likely jump out of this region. So he will be less frequent there. Let's change the correlation parameter to the opposite. So if the stock moves up, volatility moves up. Black Scholz, Bachelier, okay, I can maybe forget about Bachelier, Heston. So now if you compare Heston to Black Scholz, you see that Heston has less density in the region of higher stocks. So if the stock moves up, Volatility becomes large, which means that it is likely that he will leave this region. But this is now a nice intuition for volatility. Maybe you didn't have this intuition. The region where volatility is high is the region where the stock doesn't like to be because he will leave this region due to high volatility. The region where volatility is low is the region where the stock will be often. Okay, so you see this from this little experiment. Maybe it's much clearer to see this if you look at 
the implied volatility. And I have prepared another nice example here. And I'm calculating now the value with a different model. So maybe I can comment these guys here out. I will now calculate the value here using just the analytic Black-Scholes formula. Okay, if you use just the analytic Black-Scholes formula, and maybe I just set here this parameter to zero, then you see what you will get out is just the density of the Black-Scholes model. Okay, that's. The reason is that I use the Black-Scholes formula with a volatility parameter sigma being 30%. But now you can do the following, and this is the so-called uh, yeah, implied volatility. You could say that I use the Black-Scholes formula with a parameter sigma that depends on the value of the strike. So actually that should be here the, the K. Yeah? So maybe I place here the K. So I view volatility as a function of the strike. Uh, this will happen on the market. Yeah, The prices you observe are not consistent with Black-Scholes model, but you can calculate the Black-Scholes sigma for any price you observe. So you will get a, a function here that is not a straight line, the concept of implied volatility. Then I use this in the valuation. So you see here in the valuation, it's just the same code as before, but now value is an analytic formula where I use a Black-Scholes formula with a volatility function that depends on the strike. And for that guy, I plot now the density. And now I can trim up here some volatility functions. So I made here a very strange volatility function. So the volatility function, this is now implied volatility, is just the normal volatility. And then I, I add a small hump to it. And this hump is just the cosine. Uh, the cosine scaled with a certain size here and having a certain amplitude. So let's put this hump on top of the volatility function with a certain amplitude, say 1.5 and a certain, certain size. Okay, so you see now my implied volatility function is like this. And suddenly here in the region where the volatility is high, the density is pushed down, is becoming low. Huh? So now if you compare this to the case where I had the zero, this is below the normal Black-Scholes case. Okay, this is the normal Black-Scholes case. It's a log normal one. And here it is pushed down a little bit. Okay, so again, where, oops, this is the other way around, right? Like that. So that, there's the picture. So if I have flat implied volatility, I have a perfect log normal distribution. If volatility becomes higher here, it will push down the density. So he doesn't like to be there. And now you can create here amplitudes or changes to the implied volatility. Well, maybe I do it much higher. That creates arbitrage violations, yeah? So you see the shape of the volatility function still looks reasonable. Why, why is that not a reasonable shape here? But it will create arbitrage violations. So you see here the density becomes negative in the region, yeah? This model is not arbitrage free. Okay, so that was it for today. Maybe this is a nice experiment to get some intuition for the relation of volatility, prices, and densities. And you can also play with this a little bit at home. Thanks. That was it for today.